All right, good evening. It is 7.01, so let's get started. Welcome back to another episode of Dr. Riley Plays Games About the Past. I really must do something about that title. But uh, for today, we are switching things up. Instead of playing Twilight Struggle, we are actually going to be playing Fort Sumter. So, hello again. Fort Sumter is a another card-driven game by GMT, but it is uh, slightly different in how it handles uh, a lot of different mechanics than Twilight Struggle. Quite different games, and uh, I particularly like it because, like some of the best games out there, um, the complexity doesn't derive from opaque rules or or difficulty that way it comes from the challenge of your opponent having a, a simple straightforward set of rules that both sides agree upon um, and then having to outmaneuver one another so it's much more of chess than say a game of diplomacy um, it's nice it's clean and what i really like about it is it plays in about 20 minutes which is a lot of fun uh for for me because a lot of gmt's games their their historical simulations can be quite lengthy and that's totally fine if that's what you signed up for um but sometimes you just want a quick game that you can sit down and in 20 minutes bang have a really rewarding experience uh, and that's what we're doing today so let's go ahead here and uh all right, get started. In addition to playing Fort Sumter today and talking about it, uh, I'm also going to be talking about Dr. Dombey's new book, The False Cause, Fraud, Fabrication, and White Supremacy in Confederate Memory, because this stream is for the benefit of my students in my History 245A class, which is Civil War in History and Memory. And it's very exciting for me because that's my specialty as a scholar. I just want to turn down the background audio a little bit. It's a little loud for me. Uh, by all means, let me know if that is not uh, loud enough for you. But for right now, all I can hear is the game music. So let's go ahead and get started. All right. So we are going to be creating a game here. All right. Da, 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 da. Oh. I already seem to have one in progress. Let's go ahead and get rid of that. So here we go. Create game. And I just want to take a second to appreciate the interface here because it's just so well done. Um, it really is a nice piece of work. It's uh, very aesthetically pleasing. It looks like it could have come straight out of Harper's Weekly. Um, it really is quite nice. So what Fort Sumter is, it is a game that is based on control of specific aspects of the country during the secession winter um, between Abraham Lincoln's election and uh, really the inauguration and the first call to arms and the firing at Fort Sumter. Um, and so you're trying to control different aspects of whether it is the military situation by grabbing control of federal arsenals, whether it is public opinion through the control of the newspapers or state assemblies, whether you are trying to craft a political victory through control of D.C. and, and uh, Montgomery, or whether you're trying to keep the secessionist states in line directly through control of, say, the ever-pivotal border states, um, states that had some pro-unionist sentiment, uh, particularly like Texas with its unionist governor, Sam Houston, um, and the Deep South, of course, which harder to find unionists there, but they did exist. So what we're going to do here, let's do a random sides for this first one. I like going, going in not knowing uh, very much. And uh, for anyone who... Uh, oh, good evening, Doctor. Welcome to the stream, Esoterisk. Uh, nice to see you here. All right. And let's take a look and see how we're doing. All right. Good, 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 good. Do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do. All right. Okay, looks like we're up to seven viewers. That's lovely. That's lovely. So, here we go. Let us begin. Random side. So if you've never been to Fort Sumter, it's really worth your trip. Uh, it's a phenomenal national uh, uh, 
park out in Charleston Harbor and uh, it's very well maintained and uh, it's very much worth the ferry ride to get out there so all right here we go first round the game is played over three rounds and then there is what we call the final crisis all right looks like I'll be playing as the unionist so it doesn't necessarily mean I'm playing as the north what it means is as I am playing as those Americans who did not want secession uh, and there were quite a few southerners in fact statewide plebiscites in Virginia North Carolina and Tennessee all failed initially to produce a secessionist uh, vote and so there were people who were out there who didn't necessarily want to go with the Confederacy but here we are all right so now I've swung the pendulum too far now I can't hear the uh, the game at all so let me see if I can fix that the people. all right let's go let's try that so Lincoln has been elected it is November 1860 and already the secessionists are feisty they're frustrated they're upset they don't like that this guy is being put into power despite not getting any votes from southern delegations uh, you know he doesn't carry a single state in the south but the northern states have enough electoral votes that he gets elected so here we go what you can see here on the screen is what I was referring to you've got different dimensions and what's nice is they're both color-coded and have unique shapes so your political spaces here and have unique iconography too I mean it really they really did a great job of making this uh, accessible colorblind friendly I mean they, they this is really great but you've got your Liberty Bells in yellow and square here these are your political spaces your border states are rectangular with this grayish color excuse me not just border a secessionist states period public opinion is in green uh, represented by abolitionists sympathetic state houses and of course the ever important newspapers and then lastly you have the military dimension which is represented by the federal arsenals writ, writ large sort of all federal arsenals across the south Fort Pickens, which is one of only four forts that never falls into Confederate hands in the South, and Fort Sumter. It's the game namesake and uh, really is the flashpoint that sets off what starts as a series of disagreements and then turns into a full fledged war. All right? So, how the game is played each turn is you are dealt a series of cards and anyone who's familiar with how GMT does their card based games this should look quite familiar just uh, oh boy one second got my tea here already now apparently when I play games online I'm notorious for leaving my spoon in the cup and any of the people who play games with me uh, from college will attest to that that they're constantly having to hear the old spoon clanking against the mug but uh, for you all I will take the spoon out and be nice all right so the cards come in different types you have unionist events indicated by the blue you have secessionist events indicated by gray and I don't have an example here to show you but there are events that can be used by either side on your turn you're going to be placing using these cards to place tokens which come from a collective pool onto the board and this represents influence if you will political capital in a given area um, and so the more influence you have in a given space uh, the more likely you are to control it having influence the most influence in all three of a given dimension spaces is how you score it so if I we get to the end of the turn and I'm the one with points in arsenals Fort Pickens and Fort Sumter I can win now there are some potential things to watch here for yes it is about getting your tokens on the board but it's also about token management because if you push too hard for your particular side you can potentially turn moderates against you and this is represented by the fact that there are different zones so your first five tokens are free you place them on the board no problem when you break into one of these zones called an escalation initially there's no consequences yes you're the one who has escalated things you actually get access to a couple bonus tokens but if you keep raising tensions there will be drawbacks so the first person who actually breaks into the tension zone permits their opponent a chance to play this very powerful peace commissioner the peace commissioner goes to any space on the board and locks it down 
because what this represents are advocates uh, of a sort of middle way trying to hammer out an agreement that's not going to work um, but they're using up a lot of attention and resources and time and so you want to be very careful that you're not awarding this to your opponent because it can potentially lock down a crucial area and permit them to score or yourself from scoring and if you continue to be too bellicose, if you're too aggressive, and you end up breaching the final crisis phase, the first person who goes in actually loses a victory point. So it's this attempt to gain public opinion and gain support for your particular worldview without just browbeating people with it. The point is to not just knock people over the heads. Mm. So how each round goes. You get your four cards, you're going to play three of them, and then one will be discarded towards the final crisis phase. And how you determine what you're trying to do each turn is you get a pair of objective cards. You're going to keep one and discard the other. So it's very much a game of incomplete information. I can guess at what my opponent's trying to do, but I can't know for sure. So for me, I get to choose between controlling Texas or controlling the Deep South. Yeesh. Now let's see, those are both secession spaces. Neither of my event cards really do much for me there. The New York Press, which refers to sort of the collected newspapers coming out of New York City, which was the information capital of the country, and Horace Greeley specifically, um, one of those newspaper editors who is responsible for uh, a lot of what we read from this time. Now obviously I can't use events that are designated secessionist, I can only use those for the point value on the card, and in this case, ugh, they're not great, they're pretty low value, so I'm going to have to be creative. Let's go with securing Texas. Sam Houston is a unionist governor, maybe he can keep the state in the union for us here. All right, so how play goes is, in the event of a tie, the Unionist has to go first. And that's not so bad, except there's a great value in this game to being the one who reacts to something, rather than the one who acts. So on their third card play, the Secessionist player gets to play something that I can't counter, I can't do anything about it, um, and that can be quite stressful. So let's see, I want to open with something innocuous, I don't want to give away the game. Let's just go ahead and place one of my tokens here in the border states. Now, each of these four crisis dimensions, military, secessionist, public opinion, and political, has one space that is double bordered, and we call this the pivotal space. Having control of the pivotal space at the end of the turn allows you to move and remove tokens from the board. And so this is, again, part of that ever-important resource management side of the game, because you need to not overcommit. You want to have exactly as many tokens as needed to score a space and no more. And there's actually real benefits to pulling excess tokens off the board. Um, so if you're going to try and score an area, you have to have the ever-important crisis dimensions. Now we're going to see what the secessionists are up to here, and uh, I figure we'll get a couple turns in before I turn to uh, turn to Dr. Dombey's book here, but it was a phenomenal book. I'm so excited for it. Alright, so what did they do? They used inauguration, which could refer to either Abraham Lincoln's in March or Jefferson Davis's in February of 61 to place tokens and it's really nice because you can either add or remove, but they chose to just use it for its value, and they've placed a couple of different pieces here. Now, I have no idea which of these might be their objective. All I can say with any certainty is they're challenging me in the border states. Let's go ahead and secure Texas and try and make it look a little innocuous here. Like, oh, just sort of a casual, you know, who knows where I'm actually going. Um, but it's the AI, so they probably know. Oh boy. Secession Convention, place up to two tokens in any spaces, and they reinforced Montgomery and Washington. So it looks like they're making a play for the political side. That gives me... I 
think I'm going to play this for the event and put three tokens to newspapers. If they don't match me there, I'll be able to redistribute them to the abolitionists and state assemblies and thereby score public opinion, and ideally they will leave Texas alone. This is a bit of a gamble here, and I don't know what their true objective is. Okay. Smart plays on their part. Again, that's the value of being able to react. So they're going to have the pivotal border states. Now, they might use that to get rid of my influence in Texas. They might not. Hmm. Let's go ahead and move one there and send one of theirs back to their pool. So that's not enough moves to be able to score because I need all three spaces and I only have two. And if I move this to state assemblies, then we tie, and that's just as bad. So no dice there. Let's see what they do. Ah, they used it to get rid of both of mine. That's terrible. Yep, the secessionists did score the political side of things. There wasn't enough to score anywhere else. Oh! Oh, that was unexpected. So... <laughs> We rushed through that. That wasn't um, my intention at all. At the end of each round, when you score, you check to see who controls the location. Now, ideally, you're the one who played the objective card, you score it, and then it lets you do something. But in this case, what happened, and I'm actually just completely flabbergasted, the secessionists permitted me to have control of the newspapers, and... I scored their objective. Now, I don't get the bonus, because I wasn't the one who played it, but they basically gave away a perfectly good victory point. Um, so now we're up to the Buchanan lame duck uh, phase. Lincoln has been elected. He won't take office, though. Um, all right, he has to get through all of November, December, January, February, and then he gets inaugurated in March. And during that time, President Buchanan is kind of just doing nothing. Um, members of his administration are scrambling, trying to keep the United States from coming apart, and a number of those people will end up being tapped by Lincoln to be uh, major members of his administration. But for the most part, President Buchanan is fiddling while the Republic burns. All right, all right, so let's see. Montgomery, I could go with, but they already have control there. Or Fort Pickens. That's going to partly depend on what my cards let me do. A temporary truce, so I could get control and then lock it down with the Peace Commissioner. That's kind of exciting. Remove tokens from political action spaces. That might be helpful to break up some of their control here. Add up to three tokens to secession spaces or remove them from political... So a number of things that will let me remove tokens as well. I think the fun play is Fort Pickens. Amazingly, um, when Florida secedes and uh, they send a militia company to try and capture the fort because of its strategic location, the guy who's leading the Confederates is actually the individual who had built the modern fort. Um, but he's unable to get the fort back in no small part because the United States Navy, which remains incredibly true, um, is able to provide offshore support and drive away the militia companies that make a couple attempts at the fort. Um, so it does remain in U.S. hands uh, throughout the course of the war, and there's very few uh, arsenals and forts in the South that can make that claim. All right. I think I want to keep my options open. So Minutemen, referring to the fact that Southerners saw this as a second American Revolution, and very early on they started crafting sort of rapid response units that could pop up at a moment's notice. Um, and it's not a coincidence that they're calling them Minutemen. They're deliberately trying to evoke the spirit of 76 for their cause. Human action can be modified to some extent. Human nature cannot be changed. Whoa. Okay. Hold on here. What on earth did they just do? They played Louisiana Secedes for the event, and it removed two Unionist cubes from newspapers. So Louisiana Secedes, I mean, we don't have to really stretch our imagination to figure out what event this is referring to. They used it to pull some of my tokens off the board and free up 
space here in the public opinion ones. Hmm. So now that I have Fort Pickens, I'm just going to go ahead and send a peace commissioner there and lock it down. You know, no conflict here, no arguments here. So if nothing else, I'm guaranteed to at least score that point. Now my goal is to try and prevent the secessionist player from getting any more influence on the board. They already have everything they need for the political dimension, and they're on their way. What are they doing? Oh, yeah, they are definitely going for the secessionist side. And they get to play after me, so whatever I do here needs to inconvenience them enough that they... Oh, Feather Mustard, is there a scenario where North or South end up split and never reform together? Um, no, only because this is a, a game that only gets us to the ending of the secession crisis, so either the Union is going to be held together through sheer force of will, or it's going to separate and then the Civil War happens. Um, so it's not necessarily a secessionist win as in we won the war. This is a secessionist win as in they get enough support to break off. Whether they win the war, that is to be left up to other um, games in the GMT uh, inventory. Amazingly, some of them which were designed by the same guy uh, who designed this. And it's a phenomenally well done card driven game that simulates the war. Um, and it's one that I used in my 245 class. I broke them up, and we had, you know, uh, United States versus Confederate. And uh, it was really quite fun to sort of get into the alternate playouts and what could happen and ha where the cards both represented and distorted sort of the historical record and what was going on. But uh, this game only deals with the secession crisis, um, not the full conflict. So it's a fair question. Thank you for that. Now I have to decide. Uh, I have to decide. Do I use the Republican Party's ability to try and make a claim for the political space, or do I challenge them in... I think I just give up on the secession dimensions um, and use this to add... We're going to overcharge Washington. If they want it, they're going to have to add three of their own which means they're not going to be able to get a score anywhere else. I don't love this play, but it could work. Now on the bottom of each card, you see right there that says public opinion, this one says secession, holy cow, I didn't even see what they did. These refer to the four different dimensions, and what we're doing is we're each setting aside one of our cards for the final crisis. So after three turns of this, placing and jockeying for position, there is a final crisis moment. And what cards you have saved for the end game do matter because we're going to arrange them as we please and then play them. And if they match, it gives us an opportunity to um, withdraw tokens from the board. If they don't match, we can add tokens to the board. And again, incomplete information. There's no way to know how your opponent is structuring their cards. And so it's a bit of a gamble. You're trying to protect the investments you have on the board while chipping away at the things your opponent is trying to leverage. Oh boy. All right. So here we go. Crisis dimension. What we are looking at is whether or not any of us have control over the pivotal bonus, uh, excuse me, the pivotal space for each crisis dimension. Okay. There that goes. So I didn't have control of any of them, so I couldn't do anything. But what I did manage to do was block Washington, D.C. They managed to tie me there. So they don't score the political side, but they do score uh, the secession angle. I was not able to get them there. Oh, so this is delightful. This is delightful. I managed to score my objective, which was Fort Pickens. I can remove up to three tokens from armament spaces, or remove up to one token from any space. <sighs> well, there's only one token, really, um, that I think I want to get rid of uh, from armament spaces anyway, and that's the, the secessionist one. But would I rather take away 
something that would let me challenge them in Washington? That's a great question. And they don't score Washington as their objective because we tied there. Now, I don't get it either. And because these are revealed simultaneously, me uh, taking this away shouldn't get me the victory. But I believe I want to do that. Send home that secessionist influence in D.C. It's not needed. It's not wanted. Um, and that will permit me a chance to make a strong play for the political side in the final moments here. So, all right. Let's commit that. All right. And now we get to the intensification of the crisis right before the war. Jefferson Davis is, uh, I've always sort of bristled at the thing that he's elected. He's nominated for the presidency uh, by a number of southern delegates at Montgomery and he accepts and then after the fact the Confederate Congress holds an election where Davis is basically the only option so yes he is elected I suppose to lead the Confederacy but in only the sense that he's the only name on the ballot um, but he's inaugurated in February he's actually already in office by the time that Lincoln takes office in March so here we go, the final round. I can't get over how aesthetically pleasing this game's interface is. Um, the board looks so good. Um, the colors are vibrant. They're easy to look at. It's, uh, it's really well done. Oh boy, all right, here I am. I'm waxing all poetical and I'm not paying attention to what's going on. So we've got abolitionists, which I already have. Shh, don't tell the computer. Great. Or... Montgomery, which I do not presently have, but I am interested in making that play. So again, it's going to come down. William Lloyd Garrison, fiery abolitionist. He's going to let me put tokens into these spaces. That's great. Ditto Frederick Douglass. I, mean, I don't even really need to look at the rest of these to figure out that abolitionism is going to be my play. But we should take a look anyway. Major Anderson, he was the Union commander who was at Fort Moultrie in South Carolina when the state is uh, getting ready to announce its secession. He makes the decision that since the fort was kind of useless and was never meant to protect itself from South Carolina, that he would move his garrison out to the much better defended federal fort in the harbor, and that's Fort Sumter. Um, and by doing, though, effectively controls the harbor. It's uh, very difficult to get in or out of it without going past Fort Sumter. And also, it's not accessible by land, right? You have to take boats out there, which makes it highly defendable. And he went there and then basically said to Washington, and was like, what should I do? Um, <laughs> how, do I, how do I deal with this? The U.S. Secretary uh, of War at the time is John Floyd, who has an incredibly complicated legacy, not the least of which because if he's not outright treasonous to the Buchanan administration, he's at least highly incompetent um, and is responsible for shipping actually tens of thousands of small arms and some cannon to the Deep South and to arsenals throughout the South prior to the outbreak of war. And... Um, there's been a great deal of speculation that he did so deliberately. He himself was a southerner. He actually gets a battlefield command when the war breaks out. It turns out he's as bad at that as he is at his cabinet job. Um, and he's largely a forgotten figure now. But uh, Lloyd is one of those ones who wants to very much, um, you know, have Anderson abandon the post and come home and sort of the general in chief of the army is uh, Winfield Scott. He feels very differently. There's a number of senators who get involved in this. And so the whole thing becomes a, a real political uh, imbroglio. But uh, Anderson's great because he lets you place a bunch of tokens into Fort Sumter. And then lastly, the social elites, which represents um, both sort of the upper crust of the North and the South, who are very much involved here. Uh, make no mistake that this is very much the Planters' Rebellion. Um, southern slaveholders are at the forefront here, and one of the most accurate predictors of whether or not an individual would be in favor of secession was residence in a county that had a high population of enslaved people. Um, it's one of those fascinating things from the few states that actually did bother to hold statewide votes, like Tennessee, the single most accurate predictor of whether a county would go, secessionist or not, number of slaves. 
So the closer you get to the Mississippi, the eastern parts of the, excuse me, the western parts of the state, much more pro-secessionist than the east up country. And that's a relationship that's born out as you cross the Appalachian Mountains or Appalachian. I think I'm showing my regional uh, dialect here. And you start getting to the up country, South and North Carolina. We know what happens in up country Virginia. They are so displeased that they quite literally secede from the seceding state and create a brand new one. Not supposed to be able to do that, but it happens. It's a fait accompli, and there's no going back now. So let's see. We're still tied, which means I still need to go first here. Ah, oh, I don't love that. But I think I want to make a real statement. We're going to play Frederick Douglass, accomplished public speaker. Oh, I have to edit the one? No problem. That doesn't change what I wanted to do at all. That is just fine for me. Because uh, if I have control of the newspapers, I have control of the rest of these spaces when I maneuver them. So commit that, no problem. Hmm. It'd be really great if I could do these streams on days when my nose does not feel uh, incredibly ruddy. Oh boy. Oh boy. So, <laughs> the secessionists have pushed a little too hard, and they have triggered the Peace Commissioner again. So I get to move this individual. Now, they just went and placed two in Washington and one in Federal Arsenal. So they're doubling down there, and they're looking to get control of this dimension back. I think... I want to take the Peace Commissioner and lock down my investment here, and then that's just one less thing to have to worry about. Now I get to take my turn. Adding three to four Sumter is not bad, but if he controls the pivotal space, which is the arsenals, was Frederick Douglass an influential figure even early on? I only know of him as advising Lincoln. Yes, um, he makes a real presence for himself uh, in the North through his writings, through his public speaking. Uh, it's one of the reasons why he becomes such a pivotal advisor for Lincoln is because he has built a reputation as being a spokesperson for issues that affect African American communities and is a forceful advocate for ending slavery, for black military participation once the war starts. Um, so Douglas is very much a uh, part of this and is really um, at play. And there's a phenomenal new book uh, out about him, just won the Lincoln Prize. Um, uh, oh my gosh, why am I uh, struggling here? Um, just won the Lincoln Prize, but it is a, it's a biography of Douglas by um, David Blight. Let me take, pull this up here. Um, uh, Frederick Douglass, Prophet of Freedom, uh, it won the uh, uh, it was a Lincoln Prize winner. It also won the um, Pulitzer Prize for history. So quite good. It really gets into his uh, his background and his history. But uh, it deals with his time uh, as an, an early advocate for um, uh, what we could collectively call sort of black rights. All right, I need to. I need to overturn the apple cart somewhere here. Um, can move to four of your tokens from any public opinion and then add more back. All right, this is gonna be a little unorthodox. Let's get rid of two of these. And now I get to place four. So one, two, three. So four is the most you can have in a single space. Um, which means that short of the secessionists removing one of mine, there's not much that they can do about it now. And uh, just for good measure, Montgomery has already come up, but let's try Northern State Houses. I'm not sure what he's up to, but let's just let's block it if any way we can. Now, if he places more than one card here, he is going to suffer a VP penalty. Excuse me, if he plays... Oh, no, never mind. He's got a token pool. He's got reserve political points. Don't mind me. And he uses one point to equal me there.
All right, all right, all right. Hmm. I should have taken one less away. I should have taken one less away from newspapers. In retrospect. Ah, it's all right. It's all right. I just need to come up with a better way. Do I secure Fort Sumter with three, knowing that he'll be able to potentially get rid of me? Or do I just do the safe play? That locks down that. And... This potentially gives me the win for political spaces, depending on what he does. So now let's see. The ability to react is so fundamentally important here. I'm really bummed that he's getting to, uh, to do this. <laughs> Took public opinion away from me by putting one measly point into newspapers. <laughs> Secessionist, you are the worst. All right, what I get to do now is get rid of that and get rid of that because I have the influence in DC and this now gives me control of all three. The there's no other board, there's no other majority space here that I control, so there's not much I can do about that. Hmm. All right. He was able to score, yep, armaments, which gives him a little bit of a lead. I'm, I'm afraid to see what card he pulls out here. Oh, the Fort Sumter card. That's terrible. That's terrible. All right, if you played this card and control the abolition space, you may remove up to two tokens from any one space. Um, I want to go into the final crisis not because that is worth one point at the end, so I want to get rid of that. This is a world of compensations. And he so now I have to decide the correct order here for these. I actually, there is a certain amount of strategy here, but what really matters is what cards he's kept and since I have no way of anticipating that I can't really do much but make a little bit of a shot in the dark I think I want to try armament secession armaments and see what happens because if I can get control no match each player starting with the first player may move up to two of their tokens from any spaces and or the token pool into one of the two spaces that match the type they played so he's adding more points to an area where he's already in the lead fine with me. I would like to withdraw one from politics and move it to Sumter and another one to balance him in federal arsenals to protect that. Oh, we're doing the same thing but in opposite directions. <laughs> so, <laughs> all right. Yep, he's over committing to there and I get why. I think I want to not use your guns against us unless I shall be employed against Fort Sumter. Try and disrupt his plans to score that dimension again. Oh my gosh. So <laughs> he got those back. Alright. So that doesn't do anything for me. So I can match him in the arsenals. Fort Pickens is just abandoned. But that means Fort Sumter, which is worth a VP at the end, gets scored. Let's see. I still have control of the political realm. He still has control of that. I think it's going to be a wash, which is going to come down to tiebreakers. Might be the sign of a good game. Or just that I didn't play very well. Yep, his secession spaces. My political spaces. I have Fort Sumter. Tiebreaker is for the win. 
And what was the tiebreaker? Who controls Fort Sumter, and in this case, the Unionist player. So, through sheer force of political will, I have kept the secessionists in the country. That's probably bad news for the four million African Americans who are enslaved because it does not provide any sort of lasting resolution to their situation, but the war is averted for now. Most likely, it's just kicked down the road. Feather Mustard says, GG, thank you kindly. We're definitely going to do this again, but what I'd like to do now is to begin to talk a little bit about the book that I've had my class reading for this week, and that is The False Cause. Um, so, just a quick little introduction here. Uh, Dr. Dombey is Assistant Professor of History at the College of Charleston, where he regularly teaches classes on U.S. history, uh, civil wars, that's plural, not just our own, and historical memory. And uh, his past publications include award-winning articles on popular memories, um, excuse me, on popular memory and race, as well as a plethora of op-eds and public-facing presentations and, and uh, pieces of writing on Confederate monuments, uh, public memory, and the Trump presidency. So suffice to say he's an expert on the ways that societies use their past to inform their present, and in this particular moment he has taken a close look at the ways that some individuals use the Confederacy to try and create a mythologized past that never existed to inform their present. Um, and it's, it's quite good and it's brand new. I assigned this for my class, Sight Unseen, for uh, this semester. This is 245A, Civil War History and Memory. Hello all of you who are joining in or will watch it later. I do miss you all with this social distancing. I wish we were together to talk about books like this in person, but uh, this is a little bit of an attempt to recreate that. So. This is from uh, University of Virginia Press, uh, Charlottesville, and it came out in February. So this is about as new and up-to-date as you get. And it opens with an event that he had some involvement with, and that is the tearing down in 2018 of Silent Sam, uh, the statue commemorating Civil War soldiers on UNC Chapel Hill's uh, campus. and. Uh, why I say that he was involved was because, let's go ahead, you know what, I played as the Unionists, let me go ahead and play as the, uh, yeah, let me play as the Secessionists this time and see if I can do it in reverse. Uh, see if I can get a win for those who want to quit on the United States because they lost a uh, free and open election. All right. The reason why he's involved in that and why he's instrumental in it is that he was responsible for locating one of the original speeches that was given when Silent Sam was first commemorated. And what is found in that speech is incredibly unsavory, um, naked, open um, references to white supremacy, to the fact that this was being put up specifically to celebrate the cause not just that was fought for during the war, which was to ostensibly create a slaveholding republic where slavery would be protected forever, but the ways in which pro-white supremacist Southerners, who we call the Redeemers, had triumphed in the years since Reconstruction had ended. And he even includes an anecdote, this is the speechwriter, uh, includes an anecdote about how he physically assaulted a black woman uh, less than 100 yards from where the statue was being unveiled because he saw her be disrespectful to a white woman. And this is 1913 that he's saying this. This is a speech on a college campus and had no fear of repercussion or even negative backlash to this speech. And uh, 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 Dr. Dombey finds this when he's still a graduate student and uh, makes it available. And it really helps sort of energize this notion that this statue has to come down. Um, and he has a really great piece here in his uh, introduction that I quite love. Um, While neither history nor memory can ever be entirely objective, memory unlike history, is not bound by facts, sources, or evidence. The gap between what actually happened and what society recalls is often a vast chasm. Additionally, memory, both historical and individual, 
evolves and is not reliant upon research as much as it is upon culture and the needs of the present. And that's quite instructive because it's one of the things that historians of the Civil War often circle back to, is the notion that so much of what we think we remember about this conflict has been shaped not by the objective search for truth, but by what societies at a given moment need from the war. And it's particularly true when we are talking about the lost cause, because whether it is in the immediate post-war years when white men are trying to reconcile how they could have possibly lost and need to find something that soothes and comforts their now challenged white masculinity, that uh, I did the right thing and I fought and I have lost, what does that say about me? Um, and so we get this narrative where the Confederacy was... Um, some of the best soldiers ever trained they were amazing and they were unchallenged and unbeatable and they only lost because the north had insurmountable numbers or an unassailable advantage of resources and some of these myths have proved incredibly sticky they are still with us and they're quite prevalent they don't just show up in websites by people who have only a casual interest in the past. Some of these can work their way into bona fide historical monographs uh, by otherwise well-meaning people who don't realize how much of this narrative has been shaped by historical actors looking to present an alternative to what happened. All right, hold on here. I'm a secessionist and I need Montgomery or abolitionist. These are my objectives. I definitely think I want to go Montgomery because I have no real way to get good points into abolitionists and it seems uh, unthematic as uh, a secessionist to go with the abolitionist space. So let's go ahead and select Montgomery. All right, the AI player is going to go first. And so we have a couple of tenets here of the lost cause that he presents. And these are not necessarily new contributions, but he is building off of scholarship that's dealt with this. And what he's basically getting at, uh, as I've already mentioned, that Confederate soldiers were among the best in human history, just unparalleled warriors who fought for a cause. They don't always necessarily say what that cause is, it's, and that sort of in their estimation doesn't matter. They fought, and that's what matters. Okay? It also requires... A particular vision of the role of black southerners as the loyal slave um, and so it routinely downplays the ways that southern African Americans run en masse to Union lines uh, to try and get away or the way that they passively resist the way that they actively resist instead it paints a narrative of the region as one of benevolent kind masters because slavery wasn't that bad in the lost cause estimation and one of contented slaves it paints this idealized vision of race relations in the past oh my cat has jumped up on the desk hey sheldon what are you doing i know what's going on you just you're gonna walk into frame or are you just gonna keep strolling around no uh, he's just gonna keep strolling around hi bud you should come over and say hi everyone would love to see you if there's one thing I know about the internet it's that kitty cat cell no you don't want in wait oh maybe he's thinking about it hi bud here Sheldon make a, make a face Look cute for the camera. Hi, buddy. Aw, oh, you're a good cat. Yes, you are. I love you. Mm. Ah. All right. What was I talking about? Do, 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 do. Not just benevolent slaves, uh, but not just excuse me, benevolent planters and loyal slaves, but also racial regional solidarity um, that the South, and in particular, uh, Dr. Dombey's book is focused on North Carolina, was a region of white racial solidarity. And so dissenters, um, unionists in the state, and deserters are all pretty much downplayed and ignored. And, and when it's not possible to just distort the past, as Dr. Dombey is arguing here, one of the things that lost cause boosters do is they outright fabricate it. They just make it up. And he has all of these cases in which um, 
neo uh what we would today refer call a neo confederate but basically lost cause advocates are just creating situations that never happened they are inventing soldiers who never existed or they are making up accounts of battles that are directly contradicted by the available evidence but if people don't bother to check because what they're being told is something they want to hear if they're being spoon-fed this sort of narrative this comfort food then you know they're fine with it all right i need to secure montgomery but he has started with some control in dc and the newspapers i think we're going to use the secession of mississippi it has to go to the deep south space ah it has to go to the deep south space Let's use PGT Beauregard, who was the guy who was in charge of the forces that attacked the fort. Uh, amazingly enough, he was a West Pointer and was the student of Major Anderson, who was the guy who was responsible for defending the fort. He had been his artillery instructor. So it was a bit of a bitter reunion uh, when the fort was capitulated. Hmm. And One of the reasons why Dr. Tom, uh, uh, Dombey, I almost said Twombly, uh, Dr. Twombly was a, a lovely, lovely man who I knew from my undergrad days, but Dr. Dombey is the historian who wrote this fantastic new work. Um, and the reason why he creates this is because, as he says, while most of the myths of the lost cause have been successfully excised by historians, uh, we go to the evidentiary record and we see there were not as some people like to claim tens of thousands of black confederate soldiers just in the ranks that the army of northern virginia was not this interracial um desegregated military force uh that there was in fact widespread desertion that there were in fact widespread um unionist communities who actively resisted conscription and were not on board with the confederacy um these notions remain incredibly popular and they pop up they pop up in history books the internet has made it actually incredibly easy for anyone to create a website or a facebook page that says you know the truth about something and often they're based on shoddy scholarship at best a complete misunderstanding of historical sources and sometimes just deliberate lies and distortions and he says these are uh, and if i can if i can uh, channel my inner patrick stewart and uh, you know captain picard says the lies lies must be challenged and that's part of what he's doing with this piece now he used minutemen for one value to gain more points in washington what's he playing at it's making it very difficult though for me to get secure montgomery I'm going to go ahead and grab it now and then see what I can do after he moves about securing my investment because I do get to react. He has to go before me. All right, so again, why does he write this? Because it's not enough for the Academy to agree that the lost cause is a fabrication. People need to understand this. All right, so he's there with all those points in Washington. I think I just go like this and match him. That leaves Montgomery alone. Yes, I am responsible for some escalation. I apologize. I'm escalating the war here. But uh, I don't think it can be helped. Excuse me, not the war. The war of words. We're not in a shooting war yet. This is still all rhetoric and high politics and newspaper op-eds. So he has the public opinion... Uh, uh, pivotal space but he has nothing to do there and no one has any of the others and nobody scores any of the area so we're on to the objectives I got mine with Montgomery and the unionist player failed to secure the support of northern state houses hmm now you may remove it to two tokens from political or well fine let's get rid of that and let's get rid of that and uh, at the end of turn one, he doesn't have a lot on the board. And I have a slight lead. But now this means I have to go first, so that's not great. All right.
so that's why Dombey writes the book um, because the lost cause is very much still with us and modern Americans are looking to it and using it to justify a whole host of things and it's not just the discussion of whether or not monuments represent the past or represent an idealized version of it, whether they are remembering as much as they're celebrating. Uh, anyone who has read Karen Cox's phenomenal Dixie's Daughters knows the answer. They were very much purposely created to push an idealized vir version of what the Confederacy was about, and it was women who were largely doing that work. And so Dr. Dobby starts his first chapter here with a look at rewriting the past in stone. It's the lovely uh, title of it. Monuments, North Carolina politics, and Jim Crow. And I was very pleased when I got to this because I was worried that he was just going to be sort of rehashing what work has already been done on this. And he's not, which is quite nice. What he's specifically looking at is the ways that North Carolinians in particular use the legacy of the confederacy and a new reimagined version of it to influence state politics and what this hap means is that you have a series of elections that are quite contentious um, as southern democrats look to regain control of the state in the 1880s ultimately culminating in a bona fide coup in which a white militia overthrows the democratically elected fusionist government. This was a biracial hybrid of white populists and African-American Republicans and throws it out. I mean, we, we have a bona fide coup d'etat in the United States in Wilmington in 1890. And after that's done, Southern Democrats take tremendous strides using this narrative fiction of a unified white South to put in place all of the things that we associate with the Jim Crow South. Polling taxes, literacy exams, grandfather clauses, anything to disenfranchise black voters and to restore what these redeemers, as they like to imagine themselves, described as proper race relations. All right, so I have to make a choice between the Deep South and Fort Sumter. Now, I already have Fort Sumter, but I do have Calhoun's legacy, which could get me some great points towards that. It is the complete and absolute subjection of one person to the control and disposal of another person by legalized force. This will force me to do more than just grab up armament, so I'm going to go with the Deep South. Uh, I did that as a way to sort of challenge myself. Yes, I know I have to start, and uh, oof, I am dangerously close here to <laughs> causing tension. But that could have its own rewards. That could potentially uh, that can potentially work in my favor. So I think I'm going to play this for its event and just do one, two, three and lock down these if he wants to challenge me there the unionist player is certainly welcome to try and he has this phenomenal uh, quote on page 17 that i'd love to sort of turn to here and uh he says this memories evolve today when those wishing to preserve confederate monuments say that these statues bear no connection to white supremacy they are rejecting what many of those central to their erection had hoped future generations would learn from bronze and stone despite the frequent denunciation of overt white supremacist rhetoric the narrative that neo-confederate and other confederate apologists promote is a direct descendant of the lost cause narrative that confederate veterans created and it's one of those things that I often quite find quite fascinating because one of the things that you hear from these Confederate heritage groups is that uh, the war wasn't about slavery, it had to do with states' rights, this sort of abstract definition of what states' rights is. It was a high-minded constitutional struggle and not what Confederates openly said it was. It was an attempt to create a slaveholding republic in perpetuity. And so I often sort of chuckle at the fact that Confederates would have been incredibly confused by modern attempts to sort of walk this tightrope between celebrate my Confederate ancestors, but do everything possible to not make them who they were and to not acknowledge the problems that came with the Confederacy. 
and that goes double for these monuments that uh, people who want to sort of play the heritage not hatred card uh, hatred hatred card you know it's not about white supremacy that was something co-opted by the Ku Klux Klan um, can't we just acknowledge that these were brave soldiers American soldiers um, and the fact that we get that transition from Confederates who are responsible for the deaths of more US soldiers than any other enemy we have ever faced to well they're American heroes and they deserve all the same attention and they deserve all the same benefits on Memorial Day and we should put out flags to them that doesn't just happen that's a process that is constructed and it is done through monument building it is done through textbook supervision and it is done through fabrication and distortion to get us from an armed rebellion which quite literally fits the definition of treason to these were heroic patriots doing something that was doomed to fail but they did it anyway because they were the ultimate people who saved the constitution and for a lot of historians we just kind of chuckle and move on and Dombey is sort of slapping us on the wrist saying we have to take this seriously because there are people out there that believe it and they're using it okay he's got my attention i'm willing to look more closely uh what on earth did the unionists do he's killing me here border states washington and federal arsenals he's really putting points on the board here i need to move carefully now it doesn't matter which of these i save for the end game because they're all armaments cards but i think i want to put one point back into border states i need to try and keep control of that as much as possible and i'm going to use the inauguration as a chance to yank influence at the last minute from washington so let's see what the ai does here mm. He specifically talks about the failures of the biracial fusionist government that exists in the 1880s and 1890s, um, or excuse me, in the 1870s and 1880s, it's largely snuffed out by 1890. Um, but what he points out is that North Carolina is kind of late to the game. The big era of monument building across the South where the UDC is doing the fundraising and such uh, is all happening in 1890 to like 1925-ish. North Carolina doesn't really get to that business until we're into the 1910s, and that's because it took a little bit after Reconstruction ended for the state to regain control. And by the state, I um, what I'm saying is by for Southern Democrats to main to regain control and wrest power away from the republican slash populist fusion ticket uh, which is a testament to how popular no pun intended those policies were in upcountry parts of the state um, trying to support poor farmers uh, sharecroppers things like that and you have southern democrats who want to get rid of this and they do when southern democrats regain control of the state they effectively make it a single party state from between the 1810s to about 1960, the Republican Party appreciably ceases to exist in North Carolina. It is incredibly solid as far as the solid South goes. Johnny Re uh, W. Clinton 84 has joined us and he says, Johnny Rebel. Well, I'm not a rebel yet. I am still a union man, just aggressively trying to become one. Mm. And what Dobby says is that this monument campaign and this rewriting is crucial to this political realignment. And we have to sort of acknowledge that and understand the connections here. Mm. All right, let me set this aside for two seconds and figure out how I'm going to answer this latest move by this unionist fool. Ugh. He used Gustavus Fox, Abraham Lincoln's secret agent, to put a bunch of stuff into arsenals. He's actually going to score it. With friendship, W. Clinton 84 says, with friendship, Brigades. I'll be quiet now. Um, 
that being a reference to Civ. I don't know how I'm the bad guy in that. I'm clearly a victim in my friendly games of Civilization, but uh, that's also fine. That's also fine. So move or remove up to two. Uh, da -da -da -da. We're going to play the event, and we're going to ditch two of those because I really don't want to be the one who causes tension if I can help it. Now, what's he going to do? Wow, really doubled down on the border states. Jeez. Well, we're going to move one of these to there. And depending upon which of these cubes he gets rid of, he could really screw me over. So, I'm going to move one to there. And one back to his pool. And just give myself some flexibility. <gasps> oh. Oh, that's so good. That's so good. He got rid of my points in the border state rather than in the deep south. I'm still going to score my objective, and that's just that's just plain dumb luck. Oh my gosh. Wow. All right. And his whole point in talking about sort of the, the fusion era is that it's one of those things that shows the lie that these monuments were created only to honor uh, the heroism of southern soldiers, right? That these were meant to be somehow apolitical celebrations of martial prowess because white southerners who had power in the state prior to this moment had zero inclination to do this. There are no appreciable Confederate monuments prior to the 1890 coup that gave power back to the Democrats in the state. And it's only afterwards that these are being put up and you get speeches like Cars, who's the guy who unveils the statue at UNC Chapel Hill in 1913, talking about the unified valor of the white race in the South. And that wouldn't have been possible 10 years earlier when you had literal biracial um, fusion tickets gaining statewide seats, not just... Um, sending senators and legislators to D.C., some of whom were African American, but having control of the state house and even what should have been the governorship before it was uh, overthrown. So, all right, so let's take a look here. Boom, another point for me for the political. However, the unionist has the weapons, and I hate to say it, but when you get into a war, whoever has the guns tends to do a little better. So, he scored his objective of having the border states, which explains why he did it, but I still scored my objective of having the Deep South. So I can remove to two tokens from secessionist spaces, or I can remove up to one from any space. <clears throat> I don't love, I don't love his control of the arsenals, I won't lie. Oh, well, he finished kicking me out. <laughs> Of the secession spaces completely. All right, round three, Lincoln Davis election. Here we go. So Fort Sumter, which is in his control, or stick with DC, which I have. Well, it should depend on the cards. Charleston, as a Confederate card, does get me Fort Sumter space. That's not so bad. Governor Pickens allows me to take Unionist cards out of Fort Sumter, so he's the governor in South Carolina. Let's, as, uh, as uh, Justin would say, let's risk it for the biscuit. Go ahead and put that there and move forward. Now, Dr. Dombey does give us some excerpts from the, uh, the speech that was given uh, when Silent Sam is unveiled. And it, it's, forgive this, it's meaningless word salad. Um, for example, at UNC's monument dedication, he, being Carr, who was both a soldier who fought um, and amazingly used to present himself in a general's uniform, even though he was definitely a private in the war, so war rank that he never officially earned, um, says that Confederate soldiers fought from a high and holy sense of duty for their childhood homes, their firesides, the honor of their ancestors, their loved ones, their own native land. What the hell does that mean? Like, that could mean anything. As much as 
Confederates were not shy about talking about why they had fought and claiming that they had fought for slavery, they tended to get a little more vague as the decades went on and began to sort of really downplay slavery's role at all in the conflict. Ah, naval relief. Let's go ahead and play this and start with a couple points into federal arsenals. Now the AI was kind enough to give me back a nice large token pool to work with here. I might still end up having to break into the tension zone, but we're going to try to avoid that as much as possible. Okay, making a play on the newspapers and fighting back for the arsenals. I think I want to play this for the event. Give it back there. Hmm. Oh my gosh, I blinked and I missed it. What the heck did he do? The, Constitution regulates the Republican Party for a value of two and placed two in newspapers, so continuing to plan to score the abolitionist and state assembly space. I can add up to three to political spaces or remove up to two from... You know what? I think... Oh shoot, wait, 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 wait. Oh, the Peace Commissioner. Wait, what? He broke into the tension space? That's idiotic. Why on earth wouldn't he have used his token pool? Uh, okay. I'm definitely going to lock down Fort Sumter now because I need that for the end game. Oh my gosh. Two to one. Yeah, yeah, okay. Cool. We're going to go ahead and place the value and go 1-2. And unless he's willing to match me there, he's going to lose the arsenals. What a bizarre play. <laughs> so as part of Dr. Dombey's arguments here that the race relations were redefined in the South... Um, it wasn't necessarily out of any distaste for slavery. Um, that wasn't really the problem. It was that these lost cause advocates were very keen to promote a particular vision of slavery, one in which the institution was benign, in which their masters were kind, and which the South was a racially at peace region. It's what I like to call the Olive Garden defense. When you're here, you're family. And yes, you might have been enslaved, but I took care of you. I helped raise you. I did all of these other really great things. And now that you have freedom, you've become uppity and you talk back to me. And this is just not great. And it was a way for whites to imagine a mythologized past that never existed in which race relations were ideal. Um, it was a way to attack the sort of agitation of Reconstruction in which African Americans are not only getting to vote, but they're voting in large numbers under the protection of the U.S. Army. And with the removal of the Army in 77 and the return of control to Southern State Houses, you have this sort of end of what they called Republican Negro misrule. And Again, not, not, not attempting to distance themselves from slavery because they looked, they thought it was bad. Most of these uh, Southerners who are writing in this era have zero problems with it. Um, in fact, they see it as the ideal race relations. Um, but that they wanted to promote a particular vision of it because it was beneficial. It was useful and it helped promote a sense of racial solidarity at a time when whites were still voting for populist and Republican candidates. This was a way, particularly useful in North Carolina, to have an us versus them, to, to posit yourself against an other, who you could then say, you know, no, nope, no, nope, like, we had it good, and it was only when these northerners, these outside agitators, came down here and started stirring the pot that we have these problems. Like, race relations were great, and we're going to get back to that. They weren't great if you were enslaved, but that wasn't really much of a concern to Southern Democrats 
at this moment. So, and why Dr. Dombey spends so much time on this is because there is a justification game at work here. Let's go ahead and move these around to make sure I get the arsenals space. Because if race relations have soured, and if Southern Blacks have been stirred up to agitation, then some organization is needed that can restore proper order, even if it requires extra legal methods. Enter the KKK. And this is an attempt to paint the actions of the first clan as not domestic terrorism designed to disenfranchise African Americans, but as the restoration of good order and proper governance to the Anglo-Saxon South. Um, and in order to get to that point, you have to have an idealized past to get back to, one in which race relations were ideal, African Americans were docile, and whites were in control and benevolent. So this imagined blueprint for the past gives you the vision of what the future is supposed to look like. Okay, whoa! Alright, a lot of movement there, not surprising. Yep, secession spaces will be scored. Armaments, I will score. They're going to get the public opinion bonus. So four to four. Now let's see our objectives. Who scores what? I definitely have Fort Sumter on lock. But they got their newspapers. So we are going to be all tied going into the final crisis. He's playing uh, with his uh, newspapers here. He's going to remove tokens from uh, up to two spaces. Whoa, he kicked me out of the political dimension. I think he may remove to three tokens from armament spaces. I'm going to go ahead and do that. I like to give myself a little bit of a final t thing here to play with. Final crisis. Peace Commissioner is removed. I want armaments last because if possible I want to be able to add or remove as little as possible. Public opinion I'm not really in the running for but we're gonna try. Alright he's gonna double down on secession spaces which doesn't affect me any. I can move tokens from spaces to... so wow he's really committing. Um, Go ahead and disrupt what he's going to try and do here. Oh, now I need to be careful because he's going to be adding tokens to the armament space. Yep, 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 yep. And I can continue to move tokens to... I don't want to add more than that because I want to save my last two here for my last play. So, all right, here we go, here we go. Oh, that's quite fascinating. All right, he fires back, so I'm going to go ahead and overcommit there. All right, so here we go. Final scoring. He gets the secession space. I get the armament space, we have a tie, but I do get the Fort Sumter space, and with that, secessionists beat the Unionists 7-6. to six. All right, that is back-to-back -back victories. Both have been close. Both have come down to some final last-minute scoring. I have yet to get a real decisive knockout here, um, but hopefully I can grab one. All right. Now, Dr. Dombey does point out that um, this is not just a white person's story. There are actually quite a few African American publications that are at work here um, and are pushing back against attempts to create this lost cause narrative. The trouble is, is they're mostly shouted down or ignored. Uh, but he has one anecdote in particular on page 40 I really did want to get to because just, ouch. Um, and what it is, is it's a, an account from the Afro-American 
which was a Baltimore-based newspaper. And they sent a reporter in 1929 to report on a, a reunion of the United Confederate Veterans, the UCV, the pr principal Confederate uh, organization. And here's what the person had to say. The speaker stood in front of 4,000 senile veterans of the Confederate Army and made utterances that indicate that they had entered their second childhood. Ouch! Oh my gosh! Um, it, it's a pretty stinging indictment of uh, what Confederates were about in this era. Um, but unfortunately, those accounts are the exception. Um, most northerners are not paying attention to what is going on at this moment they feel they're just too tired from the business of reconstruction and so they're more focused on national issues which leaves the south largely to its own devices and as a result that leaves there to be things like the wilmington coup and this era of monument building and school renaming where all of a sudden in this period of 20 years where there was once none there are now hundreds of confederate monuments that litter the landscape and because they exist we now look to them and remember them a certain way all right let's do another one i want to do random again i really want to see if i can get a win that doesn't come from just um from being so close uh, of, a, of a score here. See if I can get an actual like bona fide knockout blow. All right. And look, polling data demonstrates that this has been incredibly successful. In 2011, a Pew Research poll found that 48% of Americans believed the Civil War was mainly about states' rights, while only 38% viewed slavery as the main cause. 9% viewed the two issues as equally at fault for the war. In other surveys, Southerners and Whites have been found to misidentify the cause of the war even more frequently. But Pew surveys found that even 39% of African Americans believed that slavery was not what brought about the conflict. Clearly, many Americans, even those who do not celebrate the Confederacy, believe certain false aspects of the Lost Cause narrative to be historically accurate, likely due to its enshrinement in school textbooks, prominent monuments, and popular culture. And one of the things my students have been doing this semester has been watching civil war movies and sort of deconstructing them for the themes and the messages that come up and uh, it's amazing how many of them carry explicitly lost cause themes um and uh we're still dealing with the consequences of that as far as historians are concerned this is kind of a settled issue but the second you have you know a message board talking about the civil war it will just be flooded with people who want to go off about the irrelevance of slavery to this issue um even though it is the thing in 60 years of our national history that we can't shut up about we don't stop talking about it we don't stop fighting about it people are literally being clubbed in congress over this it's so bad that Congress puts in place a gag order over tariffs? No. Over slavery. Most of the cross-sectional institutions, the Baptist Church, the Methodist Church, have splintered by this point into northern and southern branches because they can't agree on an appropriate tariff rate for southern cotton? No, because their congregations cannot agree over what to do about slavery. And to get to 1861 and to suddenly have it be this abstract discussion of states' rights against an interventionist federal government is to ignore more than a half century of our national history. But that doesn't stop people from doing it. And as the Pew research shows us, more than a few continue to have this notion that enslavement is somehow a peripheral issue. It's not the thing that is causing people to quite literally kill each other in Kansas. And, as Dombey puts it, it's why he, is, he needs his book. All right, before I turn to uh, chapter two, where he really gets into the ways that North Carolinians sort of reinvent and reimagine themselves, I do want to just take a, a minute here and uh, take a look at what's going on. So I am the Unionist, and let's see, I have state assemblies or border states. Now, the Fugitive Slave Law lets me get points into 
lets me take points, lets me redistribute points from secession or political spaces and then use them anywhere. John Brown's body gets me secessionist spaces, but Frederick Douglass gets me public opinion space. Oh. Gosh, I actually don't even know what direction I should go here. You know what? This is going to come down to importance. Border states is a pivotal. State assemblies is not. I think I would rather focus on a pivotal space for an entire dimension here than not. The main cause is definitely slavery. Do you think it's sort of mental trickery to avoid white guilt uh, for someone who is, say, a Southern and is white to be swayed to the narrative of lost cause being more important? Um, so there's a whole host of things as to why um, people get around this and, and why sort of alternate causes come to the surface. Uh, part of it is, you know, um, an attempt to, it's very difficult to want to celebrate, you know, my great grandpappy who fights um, if I think the cause is, is unjust, um, right? Nobody wants an ancestor who fought to perpetuate race-based chattel slavery, but uh, to have an ancestor who stood up to say federal overreach uh, to an, an intrusive uh, nationalist government, like that's a much more useful story. And so I think part of it is personal. Um, but other parts of it, I, I think, is also unwitting. It, uh, lost cause advocates have done a really, really good job. Um, and this is a point that Karen Cox makes. I mean, it's not just changing the causes of the war. It's who is fighting and the unified sort of image of this South in which the Southern ladies are sacrificing everything and the men are gallant and heroic and... Um, their leaders are unparalleled paragons of virtue. Um, I mean, just, just what was it? It was yesterday. Like I saw a message board about, you know, how the South couldn't have been about slavery because Robert E. Lee didn't own slaves. One, yes, he did. Two, he's not a spokesperson for the entire region. What he is, is the commanding officer of one of the largest rebel armies responsible for the deaths of tens of thousands of United States soldiers. Why should I care anything else about him? <laughs> so it, it's a fair question, like why, why this becomes so um, pervasive. And, and part of it is, yeah, you know, racism is a tough thing to talk about. And some people are willing to put in that work and some aren't. And to have an alternate narrative in which the war wasn't about slavery at all, is uh, comfort food. It's easy to it's easy to swallow, right? Because then it becomes just a simple question of uh, you know an all white struggle of heroic men at arms, and that's largely a narrative that comes after the fact, uh, and is one of the things that um, people who write about Reconstruction sort of look at was the generation that fought the war. Um, they ha they didn't really forget you know, who was responsible for what. But as that generation got older, there was an immense sense of wanting to sort of move past it. Like, let's not keep waving the bloody shirt, so to speak. Um, and so what happened was causes started to fall by the wayside. And what you have are these reunions of veterans at places like Gettysburg. And it's this sort of shared, you know, experience right you fought for one side i fought for the other it doesn't really matter because we were both soldiers and we both went through that experience and this is something that happens again and again i mean think about um we've been interviewing world war ii veterans uh in the decades since and uh how many of them say very similar things uh, notably often about germany not as much about japan um, uh, which is quite telling in and of itself, but would say things like, you know, oh, I don't know about, you know, these men I fought against, you know, maybe they weren't bad people, maybe they were guys like me, um, and in a different life we might have really got along and had this sort of shared camaraderie of our experience. And um, that's a lot of what's happening after the war is, uh, you know, we get these famous op-eds and these famous photographs of veterans shaking hands at Gettysburg. Um, but what we have to remember is there's far more veterans who don't go to these reunions than ones who do. 
And so we have to be very careful about using the ones who do go as representative of how um, all veterans felt. And also, that's an overwhelmingly white narrative. There were plenty of people of color. I mean, you talk about Frederick Douglass. To his dying day, he said, I will never forget which side fought for which. No, you are not both equal in my eyes. You are not both American heroes. I know which one of you fought to keep my race perpetually enslaved, and you are not equal in my mind to these men who fought, perhaps not initially for emancipation, but they came around to it. And, uh, you know, it's uh, there's another historian puts this much better than I, than I can, uh, so I'll paraphrase her, but uh, basically white national reconciliation is accomplished at the cost of black people. Ever watch HBO's Watchmen? What are my thoughts on reparations for descendants of slaves in the United States? I have not seen Watchmen, um, in part because I don't have uh, I don't have HBO uh, Go. Um, I used to horse trade for it with someone, but I, uh, I unfortunately have not had a chance to see it. Um, what are my thoughts on reparations? I think it's a conversation we have to have. Um, there's and thanks to phenomenal work that historians have done, have made this more apparent than ever, but there's no denying the connection between race-based chattel slavery and American economic success. We quite literally build this country's wealth on unfree labor. Um, there's no neat and easy way to separate manufacturing in the North from international trade with Europe from cotton production in the south or other major cash crops um there's no easy way to separate the north's use of enslaved labor in its early days uh to, to plug labor gaps when there weren't enough indentured servants or free people uh to to work and i think there's a national conversation that does need to be had and does need to be taken seriously the fact that it hasn't happened yet doesn't mean that it shouldn't i, I don't think there's a how do I say this? I don't think that there is an expiration date on doing the right thing. Now, what shape reparations would look like would need to be sorted out. Um, I don't think that means that we don't have that conversation, but it does need to be one that's discussed. Where is it coming from and who is eligible? Um, and look, I mean, if we need a better example, we already did this for another group. Japanese Americans who are interned are awarded reparations by the United States government. Now, be clear, it's a pittance. It is a fraction of the amount of economic uh, loss that is incurred because of uh, internment. Uh, even conservative estimates emphasize that uh, Japanese Americans' families lost something like $400 million in assets. Uh, from closed businesses, from ransacked homes, from uh, the inability to work. And they get a fraction of that back, but they do get it back. And there were more than a few people who were left scratching their heads and they said, okay, good, right? Like the United States government made a mistake and it's owning it. But what about 400 years of unfree labor? Where's that conversation? And so it's interesting that it is once again back in the national conversation. Um, I think people who want to dismiss it too much out of hand should take another fresh look at it. Uh, I don't have a great solution as to how to just, oh, every family gets this amount. Um, I, I wish it was that simple, but I think there needs to be more than just, you know, a number of states have issued apologies in the years since, like, oh, we're sorry for slavery. Like, okay, that's great, but what are you doing for communities that are directly affected by this now? And not just reparations for slavery, rep reparations for disenfranchisement for decades of segregation because that all affects a community's ability to earn money and as as we like to say pull ourselves up by our bootstraps when you cannot vote for representatives who represent your interests when you have to pay um unfair taxes that your uh, white counterparts are not subjected to when you can't send your children to the schools where they ought to be going because of unfair policies all of that is part of it um i i think it would take uh, a substantial sum 
to get a full cost accounting of what slavery and deseg and segregation has done to um, non-white communities in this country. It's an interesting question, and uh, it's not it's not a popular one to dive into, um, but uh, I appreciate you asking. All right, so I want to control the border states, and I'm the unionist player. I do have to go first, and I think we want to start with John Brown's body. This was a popular song that came out after John Brown. Interestingly, Dr. Dombey does mention John Brown because when we tend to think of him, we tend to not see him we meaning a generalized United States, as a freedom fighter per se, but as uh, someone who was a, a dangerous insurrectionist who, who caused violence and bloodshed wherever he went. So his cause to end slavery becomes irrelevant because his methods get criticized. And so he is seen as, as a problem rather than as a martyr for a greater cause, um, which is quite ironic considering that the Confederacy was literally willing to start a war that results in the death of three quarters of a million people and will maim and wound another 1.5 and produce long term health problems for these people over this same issue. Um, but it's the difference between doing it the right way, I suppose, and the John Brown way. All right, so they used the social elites to place some influence. Let's double check. Federal arsenals, Washington, and newspapers. They're jumping right into the big three pivotal spaces. Uh, now I don't exactly know where they're going with this, but I think I want to escalate. One, two, three. Boom, a little bit of escalation, but that's okay. Frederick Douglass is going to write some op-eds here and really push back against the secessionist narrative. So let's see. So chapter two in Dombey's book is dealing with these um, invented Confederates, and uh, he uses that term quite literally, in no small part because one of the things that the uh, Confederacy does is excuse me, the, these ex-Confederate uh, advocates do, is they need to create an idealized version of their past, because the reality in North Carolina is actually quite slippery. Um, North Carolina had disproportionate amounts of desertion. Uh, in fact, during the war, people like Lee tended to call the North Carolinians unreliable, so they had to contend with that legacy. North Carolina had to resort to conscription before the rest of the Confederacy. And to be clear, the Confederacy has to resort to conscription before the United States tries it, uh, because they just could not fill their quotas because there was that little enthusiasm for the war in the state. So th they're having to deal with that legacy. They're having to deal with the legacy of de high rates of desertion. They also have to deal with the fact that you have resistance to what the Confederacy is doing, the farther away you get from the coast. So in the upcountry, uh, sort of the Piedmont and uh, the Appalachian counties, um, some of those are pr very pro-unionist. You know, they might not be pro-Lincoln, but they were not willing to leave the United States. And a number of them form their own communities. They actively fight back against uh, North Carolina Home Guard units. And uh, if you really want a taste of how just deliciously complicated this is, there's a very excellent text by uh, um, Barton Myers called Rebels Against the Confederacy, and it is about the sort of pro-unionist sentiment in up-county, uh, up-country counties in the Carolinas, and uh, it's phenomenally well done and gives the lie, along with Dr. Dombey's work here, to a lot of what's going on with lost cause advocates who were trying to paint this picture of a unified South where we were volunteers, and if we deserted, it was only because of our immense devotion to our families, uh, which is fun because it intersects with my own work, is where I did my dissertation on, was the role of family during the war. And uh, lost cause advocates definitely jumped on that as a way to say, you know, oh, maybe North Carolinians deserted, but it was only because they cared so much about hearth and home, um, and they only did so after the cause was, was over or they only did it at like harvest time which none of which is borne out by the evidence but if you don't bother to check it makes for a great story now they placed two in washington fort pickens one two i still have control of the newspapers but not as much as i would like i think i want to play this for the value 
go ahead and grab an abolitionist space. And let's just let's just make them work. If they're gonna get the arsenals down, let's make them work for it. Um, oh, rat bastard! Oh, he had so many places he could go, and he went there. That's not a great start for me. Oh, all right. So, pivotal bonus spaces. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and get rid of that. I changed my mind. I don't like that. We're still going to get rid of that one, and we're going to get rid of that one. I hate giving him back these tokens, but... Actually, I don't like that either. One of these days, I will get this right. Only give me a second to figure out what exactly I'm going to do here. I'm only going to give him back one. I'll leave that one. Because I want him to raise tensions. I desperately need him to raise tensions. Move or remove two, I can go there and leave the rest alone, and now I score the newspapers. Okay. I get public opinion. He gets nothing. However... Oh, I score Texas! <laughs> <laughs> oh, I scored Texas. Why on earth were they playing the way they did if they had Texas as a goal? Oh my gosh, that makes no sense. So I didn't get to score my own objective, but I scored theirs. All right, two nothing is the lead right now. I'll take it. <laughs> you know what? I already have a bunch committed to the Deep South uh, in secessionist spaces. Maybe I should just stick with it. We'll do that. Okay. I do so enjoy this game. It's so quick. It's 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 easy to do, um, but the the strategy behind it, and by easy I mean the rules. The rules are very straightforward. It's place and move tokens. But um, like a game like Go, um, uh, an experienced person will always trump a novice. So this one's uh, this one's quite great here. Okay, seizing federal armories, move up to four tokens, and then rearrange them. Yeah. Let's go ahead and place this for value. Let's just try and get the border states back. Oh, I think I'm going to have to be the one that causes tension. I don't see a way around it. Southern Senators Resign would be a great card if I could use it. Oh, he's going to make life very difficult for me. He's going to make my life living hell. Alright, um, seizing federal armories. Move or remove up to four tokens and then move them around the board. Um, Screw it. If we're gonna cause tensions, we're gonna we're, we're gonna we're gonna cause tensions. So we are gonna place here. We are going to place here. Oh gosh, that'll that'll really kick things into high gear. Um, and then I don't want to use a three-point card. I want to use a two-point card. We're gonna go here and there. We'll do that instead. Yeah, I know I caused tensions, and now the peace commissioner is on his way. Uh, all right. So the lost cause needed heroism against great odds. It needs a lack of desertions, a lack of defeats, and a lack of dissent. Um, and what's really kind of fun, and if you read Carol Reardon, um, one of the things, one of ex-Confederate's favorite hobbies was the which state gave more game. And they spend decades having this fight over which side was the most... Um, involved which side had the greatest contributions and uh, North Carolina is right in the thick of this um, they're fighting back against Virginian allegations that they somehow failed on at Gettysburg um, 
And uh, Reardon's Pickett's Charge in History and Memory is a phenomenal, phenomenal piece. Um, uh, despite its age, it is a standard go-to for memory studies and really demonstrates the ways that uh, history is not faithfully recorded. It is simply constructed from the past to suit the needs of a modern society. And uh, in this moment, Southern whites were desperate to understand how they could lose and then come up with all these excuses as to why it wasn't their fault right we lost but we we were defeated but um and again some of these things have remained incredibly sticky uh, oh well the north just had you know more men that's not fair uh this that and the other like and so oh oh my gosh all right he's challenging me in newspapers and the arsenals again i um i don't like anything that i'm seeing here and uh in addition they come up with this fun sort of no true Scotsman fallacy, right? That anyone who did surrender or anyone who did collaborate or was a unionist was not a true North Carolinian, which of course they were. Like, you know, but it provided them a way to say, oh, really the real North Carolinians are the ones we're talking about here. You know, not these uh, others, these people who did not do their job and did not take care of the cause and give their all. You can't just ignore and erase the fact that tens of thousands of North Carolinian soldiers kind of wander off sometimes or go home. In no small part due to proximity. I mean, they're so close to home. It's a lot easier for a North Carolinian soldier to desert than it is, say, a Georgian or an Alabamian or a Texian. Well, Texian is what they called themselves when they were still the Texas Republic. A Texan. Um... They have a long way to go through a country that is looking for deserters. North Carolinians, pretty much in Lee's army, could slip away and be home quickly. Uh, not saying that there weren't risks involved, but, you know, there are other reasons besides the fact that maybe North Carolinians were somehow cowardly. Um, you know, they had things to do. They had families to take care of. All right. Let's place some value here. I got back some tokens. You know, if they want newspapers from me, then damn it, they're just going to have to really fight for it. Um, there we go. All right. Well, he does want uh, arsenals because he really, really went for it. Okay. I don't think I want to give him back too many tokens, so I'm just going to take back uh, one for me. Because I could use it. <laughs> I really could. Alright. And here, again, I don't want to give him anything back if I can help it. I want him to breach and suffer a, a, a penalty if necessary. So, we're good there. And before I commit to this, I am still going to score newspapers, right? And I will score border states. Okay, good, good, good. good. Ah, yep kicked me out of uh, the fort, but that's okay. Secessionist spaces are pro-unionist, public opinion is pro-unionist, and now we get to the objectives. I will score the Deep South, but what did this person have? They will score their federal arsenals, so the secessionists are starting to take over federal arsenals, but I'm getting this done. So, I can control, remove up to two tokens from secessionist spaces, or one token from any space. I'm just going to get back that guy. He's got control. So let's see what he does. Ah, okay. At least now I have a nice token pool to work with. Um, <laughs> oh, oh, welcome to the stream. Uh, ben Somlico says, this game is only five bucks. I might buy this so I can play and feel like I'm studying. You know, uh, there is something to be said for having fun while you learn, and the repetitions that go on here is, uh, is nice. It gets you familiar with some of the major players that are involved in the game. And what I particularly like um, is that in the print version of the game, which I have handy right here, show it up again, there it is, um, it comes with a playbook, and the playbook not only comes with, well, it's beautifully illustrated, I mean, it's just phenomenally done. It not only comes with sort of an extended example of play, uh, but it has sort of a, a, a history, um, a very short history of the secession crisis. That is mostly correct. Um, there's a couple of misnamed things in here. Um, uh, which at one point uh, made me sort of cringe. But 
the general history of it is not wrong. Um, and then you get to the back where you have the strategy cards. And what's nice is each of these has a breakdown of what it is and why it's included. Um, and I always appreciate that GMT does this. Their attention to detail is quite impressive. And I particularly like, uh, they have a series for the American Revolution. They call it Battles of the American Revolution. And it's a traditional hex-based war game where you place and move pieces on the board. Um, and they represent various regiments from the uh, Revolutionary War. Each one of these comes with a little booklet that explains the historical background. So why did these armies meet when they did? What was going on? What were the stakes? And what I really like is that these are written by an actual historian, PhD and everything. Um, and so it's a lovely use of historians to inform uh, what is essentially a game, but one that's a trying to be as faithful as possible. And, and it's a nice um, acknowledgement and respect of the historical craft um, by a company looking to create a faithful product. And so it's it's why, you know, I don't work for them. I'm not getting commissions on any of these. Uh, so, you know, if, if I'm hawking them a little bit too heavily, I apologize. But uh, I don't really have, you know, enough nice things to say. I can't run out of nice things to say about the way they run their business. And uh, as a historian, I think there's a lot of opportunities for their products to inform. So uh, if you want to, you know, buy it and play, good. But please do still study. I, uh, I will say that. Please do. <laughs> Don't stop studying. All right. Uh, one last one last round. Newspapers are Fort Pickens. I mean, it's not even really a question. I think I got to stick with the papers. Here we go. All right. Now, I'm still in the lead, which means I need to go first. Um, but I have built a substantial lead, so unless I really screw this up, um, life will be good. I can have three tokens, and I can lock down the Peace Commissioner. Place it in either Washington. You know what? I'm going to do that, and I'm just going to lock down Fort Sumter. Nobody gets it. All right, if I can't have it, no one will. I will burn this world to the ground. And anyone who's played a board game with me recognizes that attitude 100%. All right, so here we go. Let's see what the secessionist has up their sleeve. So Dr. Dombey is going along with um, this discussion of sort of how confederates ex-confederates um and pro-war uh gosh pro-lost cause boosters manufactured a, a narrative that painted north carolina as uh racially united and free of dissension and desertion and and he answers the who cares question um because it is a, a legitimate question that uh that we ask one another not who cares per se but like so what uh, I had a professor in grad school, Doug Bradburn, uh, who is actually now uh, the CEO and, and founding director of the um, uh, Washington Library, uh, and uh, is really doing some fantastic work at making that available to the public. But he would always have the so what. That was his big litmus test. Like, okay, the past is fascinating, and there's so much to study and talk about, but why should anyone care? And it's our job as historians to anticipate that question and talk about it and in this case he answers that so what who cared well white voters cared and creating this narrative of a shared sacrifice was then able to be translated into one of shared political unity that people who voted for this fusionist republican and populist ticket were also non true North Carolinians, just like these deserters that we don't talk about, right? They weren't the real North Carolinians. Real North Carolinians stand in solidarity today for the Democratic Party, and by today I mean like 1910, for the Democratic Party, just as our ancestors stood side by side for the Confederate cause. And it's actually quite fascinating because it gets into the ways that this narrative uh, feeds into questions of loyalty and party politics and who's doing what um and there's a great quote again this comes from carr and i just love this one this is on uh, 52 efforts to create a memory of north carolina as the most loyal state with the most and best confederate soldiers created fractures between the states because they're all trying to do this 
uh, Virginia's doing this and Alabama's doing this. Like they're all trying to prove that their soldiers were the best. And this is a quote from Carr. I dare to affirm this day that if every state of the South had done what North Carolina did without a murmur, always faithful to its duty, whatever the groans of the victims, there never would have been an Appomattox, and the political geography of America would have been rewritten. If every state did what North Carolina had done, there wouldn't have been a need for Appomattox, because the Army of Northern Virginia would have disintegrated on its own. They would have just packed up and gone home. And by the way, I chose today because today is Surrender Day. We are surrendered at Appomattox today. It seemed apropos to play a game that uh, anticipates this crisis and to talk about some of the best new scholarship that's looking at this moment. So, all right, all right, all right, all right. What on earth did they do? I keep missing their turn because I get excited. I just, it's not the same as doing it in class, but I want to talk about this book because it's really, really well done. And uh, and I look forward to the attention it's going to get. And I very much look forward to teaching it again when we get a return to normalcy and I'm back in the regular classroom. All right. Jefferson Davis for the events. Remove some of my control from the border states. Oh, gosh, yikes. I want to make sure I pay attention to that. That's not good. go ahead and put that right back we don't want them doing that let's go ahead and put that right back okay go ahead and get rid of that go ahead and get rid of that there we go all right uh oh boy oh boy oh boy um that's unfortunate so it's now at four and four. I can't add any more influence to the newspaper space because the game does put a hard ceiling on it. So if the only way I could do it was if I could remove some from there, and I can't. Um, so this is not only going to cost me the public opinion dimension, but it's going to cost me my objective, and that just makes my soul sad. So I got to find another way to do this. I think I just need to add some points to Washington and make him, uh, unless, oh, unless I just want to really go for it and make it so that he cannot get this. He's, if he's going to score something, I don't want it to be that. Mm, forgive me, my nose is runny again. I wish I could find a, a stream one of these days where I don't seem to have a runny nose. That would be phenomenal. Woof. All right. So he's gone ahead and he's placed points into the abolitionist space and the border space. Uh, pivotal space bonus. I'm not giving him back any cubes that he can use. Um, so I say yet on that one. What's he going to do? He can move things around federal arsenals, but he can't occupy Fort Sumter. The peace commissioner is stopping him at the door, so he's not going to score that one. Gosh, it might be neither of us scores anything here, which would just be phenomenal because it keeps my lead intact. So let's see. Da 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 da. Onto the objective cards. He had the abolitionist space. Big shocker. Oh, and he uses it to yank a bunch of my tokens out of Washington. So I'm five to two going into the final crisis phase. Feeling pretty safe here. Let's go ahead and do armaments as the last two, because if possible, I want cubes into Fort Sumter. It's worth a victory point at the end of the game. I want to have control of Charleston Harbor. So let's see. All right, he's still deciding. Why do I say he? It's not a person. It's just an AI. Should use something gender neutral. They. They are deciding. Hmm. Hmm. No match. So... I can take tokens and move them around. Unfortunately, I can't add anything else here, so I'll... Um, let's ditch one. Start that work. Let's see what they do. Let's see what they do. Alright, I hope everyone is uh, having a good... What is it, Thursday? It is Thursday. Um, 
nice sort of shelter in place and social distancing. Oh my gosh, they're really going for it. All right, armaments. I'm just going to give up on the border states. This isn't even worth my fight anymore. Uh, so abolitionists, you're going to go to Fort Sumter. And uh, deep south, you're going to go to Fort Sumter. There we go. Go ahead and grab some public opinion. You do you. Oh, boy. See, here we go. Each player must. We, we tied, so this means we have to do something different. We, we both played an armaments card. Each player must, starting with the first player, remove one of his tokens from a space of that location type or remove two of his tokens from any space or spaces. So I did put two into Fort Sumter just in case uh, so I can safely get rid of one. And he got rid of his somewhere else. So now we're going to do final scoring. I pick up Fort Sumter, and that is it. Six to two, my best win yet, tripled the enemy score. That is phenomenal. All right. There's so much else I would love to talk about with Dr. Dombey's book. Um, I'm barely into chapter two, but um, what I will just say with is, uh, is this. This is a phenomenal read. It's very well done. It's very accessible. Um, he deals with uh, cases of Southerners outright fabricating individuals who, did, who never existed when they try and either downplay or ignore the contributions of some Southerners. They just sometimes straight out ignore. Uh, excuse me, they sometimes just straight out create one. And he has this story of a guy, uh, Edward Cooper. He's not real. He never existed. Um, but he's given a complete backstory of deserting and being sort of let off and spared from the gallows because of his devotion to his family. And uh, it's utterly fascinating because it shows a lot about what the people who create this narrative wanted to convey, um, right? Even if we are going to ignore the deserters because we don't like that distraction, we're going to come up with an acceptable way to excuse all of these North Carolinians who wandered off. And uh, to that end, they just sometimes create entire fictional backstories. And this comes in uh, quite handy when you get into chapter three, where he's talking about pension applications, because pension applications are one of those things that is a modern day primary source that causes so much confusion for the uninitiated. Um, and to, to tell a complicated story shortly, basically, pension boards, which were organized at the county level for statewide pensions, had lots of reasons to ignore what someone actually did in the service and to just sign off on it. Uh, there's very few serious efforts to determine whether someone was a deserving pensioner, um, at least when it came to things like desertion, um, because having these soldiers who are starting to get quite old as you get into the uh, 1900s, they are moving their costs off county level books to the state. So so-and-so applies and you know you've got he's got examples of people who had been a Confederate by conscription, then took loyalty oaths to the United States, then fought in a U.S. Army unit during the war, and end up applying for both a federal level pension as a U.S. soldier and a state level pension as a Confederate. Um, like that's incredible. It's a uh, it's 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 Daniel Eaker's story. Uh, you can find it on page eighty four and eighty five. Daniel Eaker's story as being a, a pensioner trying to double dip. Um, that's just unbelievable and says so much about the sort of social safety net that existed, or for the most part didn't exist, in the 19th century. Why these become problematic is fast forward, and now, all of a sudden, who served faithfully and who deserted is largely ignored and forgotten, and now you just have these beautiful muster rolls and pension records that show all these people getting rewarded for faithful service to North Carolina. And for the uninitiated, for the, the, the historian who doesn't do due diligence, it plays into this narrative that's been purposely constructed that the state was unified, and it effectively erases white unionism in the state. It's masterfully done. From there, he segues, and to anyone who was with me in class and we read Kevin Levine's book about uh, black confederates, um, 
Dombey ends his book by talking about these and uh, uh, where this myth comes from, and uh, it's going to be very familiar to us, and that's not surprising. He's working at the same time as Levine, and so though he does cite a number of Levine's articles, um, Levine's book was not available at the time that his manuscript was submitted. Um, and so a little bit of this is familiar territory that we've gone over before, but he, he, he does spend time on how this worked specifically in North Carolina, the ways that pensions for former camp slaves were used as a form of welfare and control um the sort of class b pension records that were kept and the ways that these amounts were doled out and that for those who created them they were very clear that these were not for black soldiers these were for loyal slaves and not just loyalty during the war but people who had behaved uh, appropriately since and that's something that is in and of itself quite fascinating because to get one of these class b pensions uh you had to have the testimony of a white uh, two white people who could speak to the fact that you were a loyal obedient individual both during the war and since then that you know you're uh, an african-american who knew your place in this society that you were quiet and docile and you weren't uppity or or you hadn't been voting republican and so there's a real performative aspect here and people of color who needed this money would do the best they could to play this part and there were some people who actually doubled down on it and created these personas of you know i was the loyal camp servant and i was true to my master because there were monetary rewards and these men who come up with this and really play this role get invited to ucv and udc events where they're showered with donations and they get the attention and they get the gifts and then fast forward half a century and we have photographs of black men at confederate events and we have pension records for people of color for service in the confederate army they're not soldiers confederates were very clear on that the pension people were very clear on that in fact they cared so little about giving pensions to black men that they actually reused old pension files that had been used for soldiers and all they did is they went through and crossed out words like soldier and things like that and hand wrote the changes what's amazing to me is this has served as the basis for a conspiracy theory among confederate heritage groups that these changes were not made by pension board members doctoring their own documents but that this was something done by northern historians who went to the south and found these documents and realized like <gasps> There were thousands of black confederates fighting in the army. We must bury this truth or else our master narrative of a, of a just war will be undone. The amount of disconnect from reality that it takes to want to follow a conspiracy like that to its conclusion, rather than simply acknowledge that racists are going to do racist things for racist reasons during the 1920s, um... It just baffles me that that could possibly be a thing that is getting people's attention uh utterly confuses me uh no these are not doctored records by historians these were done contemporaneously because pension applications uh those who were filling them out were very clear these were not soldiers the amount of money you got was not the same your ability to pass it on to your spouse was not the same it did not increase in value the way normal soldiers did. There's a reason why they called these Class B, because for those who created the documents, you did not done a soldier's work, so you didn't deserve a soldier's pension. But fast forward, and now you have... I mean, there, I could go on Facebook right now and find one of these things on one of a dozen neo-Confederate heritage sites. And it would be, there it is, look at this, so-and-so collecting a pension because he was a black Confederate soldier. Uh, never mind that his pension application clearly says body servant and that his job is listed as cook. Um, he's in the military, that makes him a soldier. Confederates would strongly disagree. They would be shocked at the knowledge that people today claim that as many as 160,000 black men fought in the Confederate armies. I'd love to know where they came from and why no one seems to have 
any memory of seeing them in combat. Ever. And so Dombey deals with that at the end. And so there's a bit of overlap there with the other books we've assigned. Um, but that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. And he does bring a fresh perspective to it in no small part because he's looking at it specifically through the lens of North Carolina. So this has been Fort Sumter. Uh, it's after nine. I'm going to stop here. I hope you enjoyed and got something out of this. Um, it's always lovely to see people uh, tuning in. Uh, I'd like to do some more Fort Sumter uh, playthroughs in the weeks coming up but in the meantime i hope that you have a great night that you are being safe and healthy and uh if you would like to support this channel and the work that i'm doing the best thing i can recommend is go read a book preferably something from an academic press and uh, and a reputable author um always keep reading so have a good night